Now this is the beginning of, a, of the, our final unit here in uh, microeconomics, and this whole unit is on a concept called market structure. Happens to be one of my favorite parts of uh, microeconomics. Of course, I've probably said that about a, a lot of things in microeconomics. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a little, a, a little uh, activity here um, so that I can try and condition your brain so that you can begin to understand uh, um, market structure, okay, the idea of market structure. Okay, so forget about market structure just for a couple minutes and just join me in this uh, little exercise here. So let's say that I, that's me, let's say that I have a few friends, okay? I've got Cameron, I've got Tyler, and I've got Alex, okay? And um, we're, all four of us, we're different people, right? Uh, when people, when we're hanging out together or if we're um, walking somewhere together uh, and someone else who knows all of us uh, sort of uh, walks up and sees us, they can very easily distinguish between me and Cameron and Tyler and Alex. They don't look at me and say, which one are you? Now, every once in a while, you'll have two or three people that might look very similar. And if people don't know them very well, they won't be able to distinguish them apart. And they'll say, are, uh, are you Tyler or are you Alex? I can't remember. Okay. But generally, after you get to know people, uh, just by looking at them, you can tell who they are. Okay. And one of the reasons that you look at your friends or your family members and you know right away who they are, uh, for example, looking in videos or pictures or something like that, is because of the, their physical shape. Okay, so each human being has a physical shape that distinguishes them from most of the other human beings. Okay, um, and I have listed five of those characteristics, five of those qualities right here. The height of a person, the weight of a person. Now, when I say weight, I don't mean obviously their weight. They'd have to step on a scale. But when you look at a person... They can be kind of bigger or they can be, you know, kind of thinner. You know what I mean? And so uh, weight means like when some people look at me, I'm obviously kind of a big guy. They can tell that I'm different than somebody who's very similar to me, but super, you know, very, very skinny. So, uh, so that's what I mean by weight. Then there's hair length and then there's face shape. Uh, now, when I say face shape, I mean some people have very round faces and some people have sort of thinner uh, more uh, oval shape, or almost some people might even have kind of rectangular, almost rectangular shaped faces. And then nose shape, you know, some people have very thin noses, some people have sort of flat and maybe wide noses, some people have very long noses, some people have very short noses, okay? So there are a lot of other qualities, for example, skin tone, eye color, uh, hair color, um, a lot of different qualities that human beings have. Uh, and if, if you wanted to, you could probably write down a few friends right now and describe their physical shape, you know, what, they, what their appearance looks like, all right? Um, but uh, each person, we understand we can tell the difference between one person or another because each person varies. And when I say varies, I mean variance, meaning for one person it's one number, but then for the next person it's a, it's a different number, Okay. People vary on all of these. Now, are there two people that have the exact same hair length? Yes, it's possible that Cameron and Tyler both have the same hair length, uh, but there are other qualities about them that are different. But one thing that is the same about all of the people, one thing that's the same about me and Cameron and Tyler and Alex is this is that even though our height is different, we all have a height. And even though our weight may be different, we all have a weight. We all have hair length, even if that hair length is zero. Let's say that, uh, let's say that Tyler is bald, okay? And so that would just mean that uh, Tyler's hair length is zero. Uh, we all have a shape of our face because we, we all, each one of us has a face. And because each one of us has a nose, each one of us has a nose shape. And so here's the point I'm getting at. I'm not going to fill this in, but I'm, I could fill it in. 
And if I filled it in, you would see that based on physical qualities, that me and Cameron and Tyler and Alex are all, uh, even though we have, may have some qualities that are the same, because we generally don't have all the same qualities, we are four different and distinct people that are recognizable from a distance. Outwardly, you can tell that we're different people and who we are. And the fact that each of us has these five qualities and lots of other qualities just simply means we're human. And so what we're going to talk about today is market structures and the point that I want to get across to you in this little exercise here is the idea that even though different kinds of markets out there in the world might have different qualities, uh, the, meaning they measure differently on the different qualities, they still have qualities. And what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to spend our time talking about the five basic characteristics of any market. Uh, in, in out there in the world. All right, so think about markets. We've been talking a lot about markets in this class, and remember that a market is a place where buyers and sellers meet. So for example, there is the market for automobiles. There is the market for, uh, for, food, for um, prepared food. Then there's the market for groceries. In particular, there is the market for uh, cereal. Uh, and we could go even further. We can say the market for, um, for high fiber cereal. Okay, uh, There's the market for milk. We could say that there's the market for milk and then there's the market for yogurt. Or we can say there's the market for dairy products. So you can define the markets however you want to define them. You can define them very broadly, consumer products uh, a little more narrowly, consumer electronics, or you could define them even more narrowly. You can say uh, consumer televisions or consumer audio or something like that. Okay, So depending on how you want to define the market. Now, it doesn't matter how narrowly or how broadly you define the market, uh, every single market has buyers and sellers. If you don't have buyers, you don't have a market. If you don't have sellers, you don't have a market. So our first dimension of market structure, and like I said, we're going to go over five dimensions of market structure. The first dimension is called number of buyers and number of sellers. And here's what I mean by that. We can create a continuum, okay? And we're going to create a continuum for each, uh, for each one of these. So on this continuum, we're going to say number of buyers. Number of buyers. And on this continuum, we're going to say number of sellers. Now, in terms of number of buyers, you could have a market that has all the way over here many buyers. When I say many bu buyers, I mean thousands or tens of thousands or millions of buyers. You know, think Walmart, right? How many people shop at Walmart every day? Or think milk. How many people, or yeah, well, how many buyers buy milk uh, in a week? Okay, we're talking lots and lots of different people who are buying this item or this group of items in this market. You could go all the way down to the fewest number of possible buyers uh, that you can have. It's possible that there is only one buyer in the market. And you might be a little confused about that. You say, well, what kind of market only has one buyer? Well, think about defense uh, um, equipment like uh, tanks or machine guns or uh, fighter jets or aircraft carriers. In the United States, there is only one buyer of those products, and that is the federal government. And so there are markets out there in the world where there is only one buyer of that product. And then somewhere between one buyer and many buyers is you could have, let me put it maybe right over here, you could have few buyers, 
Okay, now here's the, the, the important thing for you to understand is that this is a continuum. And so one market that has many buyers might have more buyers than another bar market that has many buyers. And so it really depends on which market you're talking about as to when you say many. Few buyers, for one market, few may mean 10. For another market, few may mean 150 buyers. But one, one just means one, and that's important to understand. Now, in the very same way, every single market, we know every market has buyers, but every market has sellers also. And so we have the exact same thing. A market can have one seller, few sellers, or many sellers, okay? And so whenever you see a, uh, when, whenever you're discussing the market for a particular product that's being sold, uh, uh, one of the things that you want to identify uh, at probably near the very beginning is, is this the kind of market that has lots and lots of buyers or not very many buyers at all? And is this the kind of market that has lots and lots of sellers or not very, seller, not very many sellers at all? Uh, a really good example of many sellers is this, is I play a geeky card game. Uh, and uh, so one of the things I do is I open up packs of cards and uh, sometimes the cards that I get, I'm not interested in using, but they might be kind of valuable. So I go on this website and I'll list the cards that might be worth some money uh, that I'm not interested in keeping and I'll sell them to people on the other side of the country. Uh, and um, sometimes I can make you know, 30 or $40 on one card, which is kind of neat. Um, but Here's the thing, is that when I go on that website and try to sell my card, there's usually about 150 other people who are selling the exact same card at the exact same time. And in that situation, even though you may think that only 150, uh, that 150 is, is very, a few number of sellers, that's actually a lot of sellers. That's many, many sellers, especially because they're not the only people, not just the people on the website, where I sell them, there are, there are other stores throughout the country or even around the world that are selling the exact same card that I'm selling. And so when I sell those cards, I'm in a market where the number of sellers is many. And I have to make decisions accordingly. I can't pretend like I'm the only one with, a, with that card that I'm selling. I have to understand that at the same time I'm trying to sell that card there are lots of other people who are also trying to sell the card at the same time. All right, the second dimension of market structure, we call it market power. Market power. And that's just a fancy phrase for this. Market power is the degree to which sellers can control the price that they're selling it for. So it's the degree to which sellers can control the price. So when they're selling a product, do they have a lot of freedom in deciding how much they're going to sell it for? Or do they not have very much freedom at all? Do they go into the market and say, well, if I'm going to sell this, I have to sell it for this price. And there's a lot of reasons why a seller will have to accept the price that's being uh, paid in the market and then there's lots of uh, uh, variables that determine why a seller might be able to go into the market and demand the price that they want for it okay and so what we have here under market power if I say market power again I'm gonna draw a continuum here because it's important to understand that different markets and different sellers can have different degrees of market power. I'm only going to give you two words that represent market power, but it's important for you to understand that in reality, the seller is on a spectrum between these two, uh, these two terms. Uh, in the one case, sellers can have no power at all to set the price, and we call them price takers. So in some market, 
sellers are price takers, okay? And what that means is that they have no power at all. So if a seller is selling something in a market and they don't get to decide at all, the, the price is basically already decided by all the people in the market. And so when they go into the market to sell, they have to sell it for that price. Or a seller can be a price setter, a price setter. That means that they can set the price at whatever they want it to be. They have all the power. That's when they have all the power. And they can charge whatever they want. Obviously, they can only charge as much as people are willing to eventually pay, but they might decide that they, they're okay with some people not buying as long as other people do buy. All right, so somewhere between price takers and price setters, let's see, setters, are most businesses in the markets where they sell. And in some businesses, sellers are more of a price taker, and in other markets, the sellers are more of a price setter. Okay, and so the second, our second dimension of market structure is market power, and that is the degree to which sellers uh, are able to set the price in their market. All right, so our third dimension of market structure, something that affects every single market. Uh, every market can be rated on uh, the degree to which they have this quality, and we call it barriers to entry and exit barriers to entry and exit. So when you're in, let's say, a, 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 a business class and your professor tells you to assess a market, your professor tells you that you have to sort of uh, uh, describe the market. What kind of a market are we doing business in here? One of the things that you're going to want to say about that market is whether it has higher or lower barriers to entry and exit. Okay, And here's the idea. Barriers of entry to exit is the degree, it's the degree to which new competitors are inhibited from doing business in that market, in that market. Here's what I mean by that, okay? If, if there's a business that's operating in an industry and uh, there aren't very many competitors, so the businesses that are operating, they're making a good amount of money. And if they're making a profit, then there could be other businesses out there that, that are thinking to themselves, whoa, we should go join that industry. We should go do business in that market because there's a lot of money that's being made in that market over there. Now, it could be a geographic market. You say, hey, there's not many people doing business over there in, uh, in East Atlanta. Uh, we should go do business in East Atlanta because there's a lot of money to be made over there. Well, here's your question. The next question that's going to be asked in that meeting is, well, how easy will it be for us to set up operation in that area over there? And if the answer to that question is, it's going to be really easy. We can just go over there, move in, and, and rent, rent some space, put up a sign, put up a cash register, buy some stock, and we'll start selling. If it's really easy to set up business, so we're going to say barriers. I'm going to say barriers to entry here. Then if, if it's really easy to go over there and do business, then that means that there are low barriers to entry. Now, some industries, some industries, theoretically, can have none, no barriers at all. They can just start doing business right away. They don't even have to, maybe they don't even have to get a business license or something like that, okay? For example, I, sometimes I'll help people with math. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tutor people with math, and there are some people out there, for example, who they make, I don't know, they make money uh, helping people with math. And um, 
uh, when that happens, they can basically uh, just sh- go to somebody's house and somebody may pay them some money uh, to help them learn math. Well, basically, for all intents and purposes, there's no barrier to that entry or to entry into that industry because really all they need to do is find somebody who, who needs them to come explain math to them. Okay, uh, but uh, let's say all we have to do is go rent some space and put in a cash register. There's probably a little bit of a barrier because you have to be able to rent the space. You have to find the space and rent it, but that's not very difficult to do. And so that's a low barrier to entry. But there are other industries, other markets, other businesses where it's very difficult to get into that industry. For example, let's say that I wanted to start a business making automobiles. I want to make cars and sell them to people. Well, I'm going to need a factory. I'm going to need a bunch of employees. I'm going to need suppliers. Uh, I'm going to need to have a way to sell the cars. So I'm probably going to have to open up at least one dealership. It's very difficult to get into the car industry, okay, because the automobile industry has high barriers to entry. It is, it's new competitors are very inhibited from doing business in that market. And then even more so, some industries have extremely, extremely high barriers to entry. These barriers to entry are so high that really no new competitors can really ever come into that industry. That would be extremely high barriers to entry. And then we can say the exact same thing about exit or exit. Now you may say, well, what do you mean by barriers to exit? Well, there are some businesses, some markets out there where You don't only plan your entrance into the market, you plan your exit from the market if you're not making money. So let's say after doing business for about three years, you find that it's not very profitable and you decide, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I could make a lot more money going and doing something else. Well, there are some things that are going to stop you from exiting that market. One of those might be, let's say that you have a five-year lease on that space that you rented. Well, you have two more years left in that lease. You have to pay that out. When you leave the market, you're going to have to negotiate how to get out of that lease with the owner of that shopping center. And so you can't just get up and leave. In some industries, there are labor unions, and you can't just fire everybody and walk away. You have to give them benefits or severance packages and stuff like that. All right. Similarly, gas stations. This is an interesting one. Uh, Gas stations, when they open up business, they dig under the ground and they put in giant gas tanks. And uh, and then, because that's where all the gas is coming from. You know, they don't have giant tanks up over the building that pumps down. Uh, It's probably really dangerous. But those tanks that are in the ground with the gasoline in them, they can affect the environment. They can uh, affect the soil around the tanks. And before that business, that gas station, if they want to stop selling gas and they want to and they want to move away and not own that land anymore, uh, if the buyer of that land is not going to open a gas station again, then the the people, the the owners of the gas station, if they want to leave the industry, they have to take those tanks out of the ground and they have to uh, do stuff to uh, to fix the soil that they affect that they negatively affected while they were doing business there. So they can't just get up and leave their gas station because it is leaving something that is negatively affecting the environment under and around the, um, that gas station. So some industries, it's very easy to go into the industry and very easy to leave the industry. So for example, me selling cards, it wasn't that hard for me to get into the industry. I did have to, well, it's not really, for me, it's not an industry. I sell the cards because they're my personal property. But I had to set up an account. Also, it was very difficult to me to, for me to work myself up to where I was a reputable seller. And now I am a reputable seller. And once I got to that level, uh, I, was al- I was allowed extra benefits for selling. Uh, but if I wanted to leave the market, all I have to do is click on something that says hide inventory. And I never have to go back to that website ever again. I leave the market. So for selling my geeky cards, there's basically no barriers to exit, and there were low barriers to entry. But there are some industries out there 
where, for example, let's say that there's a nuclear power plant. Well, you can't just abandon a nuclear power plant. Not only are the barriers to entry extremely high for a nuclear power plant, but the barriers to exit are also extremely high. You have to find another business that's willing to buy your nuclear power plant from you, which should be reasonable. You should be able to do that, but it's still very difficult to do. And so those are extremely high barriers to entry and exit. Now, there's one more thing that I want to say about this barriers to entry and exit. And I want you to consider this. This is an important, what I consider to be very important. There are some industries that the reason it's difficult to get into that industry has nothing to do with money or ability to access resources. The reason that it's hard to get into those industries is because government organizations or other people in power set up artificial restrictions to keep people from doing business and competing in that industry. For example, a lot of counties or states restrict the number of businesses that are allowed to sell certain products like pharmaceuticals or liquor or, thing, or other things of that nature. And when they restrict the number of people or make it very difficult to get a license to sell those things, that is not a natural barrier to entry. That is an artificial barrier to entry. It's not difficult to get into the industry simply because it's expensive or because it's hard to set up supply lines. It's hard to get into that industry because if you, if you do enter that industry and you don't, are not approved by the government, then they will shut you down and stop you from doing business. And to me, I call that artificial, those are artificial barriers to entry. As opposed to the other possibility is what are called, what I call natural, natural barriers to entry. Natural barriers to entry are things like, well, I'm just having a hard time finding employees that know how to do, make the stuff that I make. The supply of the employees is just very low because people aren't interested in developing those skills. So that would be a natural barrier to entry. It's very expensive to get into that industry. I just you know, can't get the capital together. That is a natural barrier to entry because it's just expensive. Let's say that before you can even start doing business, you have to have $20 million in capital before you can even open your doors. That is a natural barrier to entry. And in particular, natural barriers to entry are usually supply or cost related. They have something to do with, they have something to do with acquiring factors of production or they have something to do with extremely high costs. And what I mean by extremely high costs is it costs so much to get into that industry that the revenues that you earn after getting into the industry, that you have a very difficult time earning the revenues that you need to overcome your costs. So basically what that means is extremely high costs. In particular, those extremely high costs are usually, usually fixed costs. So we're talking about industries that have very high fixed costs, like the airline industry. Before you can even sell one plane ticket, you're going to need to have several things. First of all, you, you know, the factors of production, you're going to need a pilot, right? At least, well, probably at least two pilots for one airplane. And one airplane, that's a fixed cost. That's really expensive to buy even one airplane. Then, as far as artificial barriers goes, you're probably going to have to get licensing from the uh, FAA if you're in the United States. Uh, you're probably going to have to talk to uh, an airport and have some sort of contractual agreement with the airport. That's probably an artificial barrier, except for the fact that airports 
are limited by the number of planes that can actually physically be at the airport at one time. That would be a natural barrier to entry. Okay? So it's important to consider that when you're assessing the barriers to entry in a market, there are several things to consider. Are the barriers low or high or lower or higher? Also, are those barriers to entry, uh, the, if they're higher barriers to entry, are we talking about artificial barriers that are made up by people in power or are we talking about natural barriers to entry? Okay? So this is a very, very important uh, dimension of market structure. So the fourth dimension of market structure that we're going to talk about right now is called product differentiation. Product differentiation. And when we say product differentiation, do you see the word different in here? Different. How different are the products within the same market? Is, are the products within the market very unique? Are they unique products? Are they not unique, but they're kind of unlike one another? Or are those products very, very similar products? And so here's what I mean by that. Let's think about the automobile industry. There are a lot of similarities among or within the automobile industry. Uh, you know, a lot of similarities. Some of the, some, uh, most vehicles in the automobile industry have four wheels. Most of them operate on a combustion engine. Uh, most of them have doors and seats and steering wheels. The, the main seat where the driver sits uh, has a steering wheel and it's uh, usually uh, uh, in front of uh, some of the passengers and on the left side of the vehicle as you're looking out the front. Okay, So these are all very common qualities. Most vehicles have those qualities. However, once you get past those basic common requirements, automobiles, especially in the United States, they, become, they start to become very different. They all have very different shapes. Now, there are some similarities in shapes. You know, you've got pickup trucks have sort of a generic shape. Minivans have sort of a generic shape. Uh, um, sedans have sort of a generic shape. But when you look at all of the different kinds of pickup trucks, and when you look at them from year to year, when you compare you know, the 2021 pickup truck to the 2023 pickup truck, you see some minor differences in the shape, in the, in the aesthetic appearance of the, of the vehicle. Also, they have different size tires, different kinds of tires. Even though most of the engines are combustion engines, Several of them work in different ways. Uh, some of them are put in the vehicle in different ways. Some of them have the parts on the engine in different places. So it really depends on which part of the product you're really looking at to determine whether it is very similar to other products or very different from other products. And in most cases, it's in the eye of the beholder. For example, I'm sure most people would probably say that milk is uh, basically the same everywhere you go, all right? Except, except that when you go into the store, you have your fat-free milk, you have your 1% milk fat milk, you got your 2%, and then your whole milk. And so those are differences. They're not huge differences. It's just differences in fat content, but the, they're still somewhat different. But what about buying fat-free milk? What if you were to buy fat-free milk at Publix versus buying fat-free milk at Walmart or buying fat-free milk at Target? Are they basically the same? Well, I'm sure in most cases they are. But like for me, I had an experience once where I was used to drinking fat-free milk from one store. And one day I couldn't go to the store and I ran out of milk for convenience purposes. I went to this other store and I bought fat-free milk and I brought it home. And when I tasted it, it had a slightly different taste, but it was enough of a difference in taste. And it wasn't that the milk had gone bad. It's just that it had a slightly different taste. So I don't know if it was a difference in the, in the uh, um, process of 
packaging the fat-free milk or if it was because it came from a different dairy with cows that were slightly different. I don't know why. All I can tell you is that the fat-free milk from that store tasted a little bit different than the fat-free milk from this store. So now I have become a person who only buys his milk at one store and I only buy one brand of milk, the same brand from the same, uh, the same chain of stores uh, uh, when, I, when I buy my milk. And if I'm gonna switch brands of milk, I'm gonna try out a few different brands until I find the one that I like. So to me, even milk is a little bit different from one place to the next. And so this idea of product differentiation asks the question, this is the degree, let me look at my notes here for a second, this is uh, the degree to which products among competitors have different qualities. The degree to which the products among competitors in, in the market, competitors have, how did I say it a second ago, the degree to which the products among competitors have, um, let's say, variance in their qualities. Is there a lot of variance in several different qualities? Are most of the qualities the same and there's only one or two qualities that are different? I have seen products where they are exactly the same from two different sellers. And the only difference between the two products is the packaging of the product. But once you take it out of the package, it's identical. Here's an example, and I hope no producer hates me for this. I really enjoy eating uh, grape nuts. It's a product from the Post Cereal Company, grape nuts. You, most of y'all probably would not like the grape nuts. I really like the flavor of them. I usually have to let them sit in milk for about 10 minutes before I actually eat them uh, because they're very crunchy and a little too hard for me. And I'm an old man, so, you know, I'm concerned about crunchy, hard things and chewing on them. So uh, grape nuts, I really like them. I think it's the, for me, it's like the best cereal out there. Uh, it comes in kind of a, kind of a small box, um, but, and it's very high in fiber. That's one of the reasons I really like it is because it's very high in fiber, but it tastes really good to me, but I don't really, I don't eat a lot of sugar. Um, so here's the interesting thing. For a long time, I was eating post grape nuts and my wife said to me, hey, at the grocery store, at Kroger, they have, uh, they have something sitting next to the grape nuts. They have a generic brand. It's called Nutty Nuggets. Nutty Nuggets. I don't know how they came up with that, but Nutty Nuggets. Okay, there's no nuts in the cereal at all. I don't know why they call it Nutty Nuggets. But, so she, and I don't know why it's called Grape Nuts, because there's no nuts in it. And there's certainly not any grapes in the grape nuts, so I don't know where this came from. So she bought the Nutty Nuggets. She brought them home. I said, hey, I'll give them a shot. So after I finished up my grape, a box of grape nuts, I got the nutty nuggets out and I opened them up and I started having them as my regular cereal. Now the first day I was very cautious. I was like, I don't know, I don't think this is grape nuts. But it was mostly in my mind. By the third or fourth day, I wasn't thinking about what I was eating. I was just taking the box out, pouring it and eating. And after about five or six more days, I realized that I wasn't thinking at all about whether they were grape nuts. In fact, I started calling them grape nuts to other people. I would tell my wife, I need more grape nuts. And then I realized I said grape nuts and I said, I mean nutty nuggets. And so to me, nutty nuggets are the same as grape nuts. They are the exact same product as far as I'm concerned. And the only difference to me between nutty nuggets and grape nuts is the packaging. And if, that's the, and, and if that's the case, then I would say that these competitors, grape nuts and nutty nuggets, they have, they have very little variance. 
In fact, I think they have no variance at all in their essential qualities and in the non-essential qualities, the packaging, that's the only place that there's variance. By the way, there is, more var there is variance in one other place too. Box of grape nuts was about $4.30. Box of nutty nuggets was about $2.30. So I was basically getting the exact same product for $2 less. Now, I told you earlier though that product differentiation in many cases is in the eye of the beholder, in the eye of the purchaser. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who love grape nuts that would try the nutty nuggets and say these are terrible, they're nothing like grape nuts. And those people have, probably have more sensitive taste buds than I do, but to me, I'm more of a texture eater. To me, there is an ident identical product, okay? So, we have two main words when we think of product differentiation. I'm gonna draw another continuum. I hope you have at least a few of these continuums in your notes. And we're gonna say product differentiation. You should be drawing all these continuums that I'm also drawing. And here's what we have all the way on one end. When product differentiation is very low, we call, it, we call these products homogeneous. Homogeneous products. But when there are very different qualities in the features, uh, or very different, sorry, very, uh, very different, um, a lot of variance in the qualities of the product, a lot of the features, have a lot of variance in them, we call those products hetero, heterogeneous. And here's, here's where these, basically where these words come from. You know, the prefix homo basically means same. And the word, the, the uh, prefix hetero basically means different or other, okay? And so homogeneous basically means it's the same product. Heterogeneous products means that the products are very, very different in the industry. In most cases, products in a market are going to be somewhere between completely homogeneous and completely heterogeneous uh, because they'll probably have some qualities that are similar with one another. Uh, in one really, I think, one really good example of a homogeneous product is or some homogeneous products are are agricultural products you know uh, carrots corn peas um, you know some people can tell the difference I guess but me I cannot tell the difference when I sit at the dinner table and there's a there's a bowl of cooked corn I can't tell whether that corn now if it was fresh corn that's a completely different story so don't don't get me started on that but what I mean is if I know that that bowl of cooked corn that looks so delicious, if I know that that was frozen corn, that that came in a bag and it was in my freezer and, and it was cooked, if I didn't cook it, if I didn't open the package, I can't tell whether that is Green Giant frozen corn or Publix brand frozen corn. I can't tell the difference, but I'll tell you the Green Giant frozen corn costs more than the Publix brand frozen corn. Uh, so agricultural products, you know, the, the, the vegetables and the fruits and, and, and things like that that we eat oftentimes are very homogeneous. Now, the producers of those products do not want you to think that they are homogeneous. Because if you think they're homogeneous, then you're only going to buy based on price, which is why they do everything they can in marketing to try and convince all the people watching TV and all the people shopping in the grocery stores that the Green Giant corn is heterogeneous. It's way different. Oh man, I know that this is Green Giant corn. It's so awesome because that Publix corn tastes so terrible. And like I said, I'm a texture eater. I, you know, I don't have strong taste buds. So when I eat the corn, I can't tell the difference. So this fourth quality, this fourth dimension of market structure is the degree to which the products that are in that market, that are being sold in that market, are they very similar products or are they very different products? All right, our fifth and final uh, dimension of market structure, we call it information symmetry. Information, whoops, that's, not, that's IF, that's not IN. Information 
symmetry. Okay. Now, symmetry means, um, it's kind of like saying that if it's over here, it's over here. Okay. So here's what I want you to think about in terms of information symmetry. There are several players in any market. And when I say players, I mean, think of it as a game. In fact, oftentimes business is kind of played as a game. There's lots of uh, uh, books and research out there that, uh, that makes business sort of uses an analogy of a game because in many ways there are winners and losers. Uh, now, ideally, if everybody sort of plays the game right, everybody can kind of be a winner to a certain level, uh, but there are always winners and losers in business, or sometimes winners and losers. And so let's say that I am a seller in a market. Well, if I'm a seller, I know that there are also, uh, that there is a buyer in the market. In most markets, in addition to me being a seller, there's at least one other seller or a bunch of other sellers. There might be a bunch of sellers, especially if the number of sellers is many. Or even if the number of sellers is few, there, there are, let's say, only four sellers. And if the number of buyers is many, then I have buyer, I have buyer, I have buyer. Okay, there are all kinds of buyers. Okay, and here's the idea in information symmetry. How much balance is there in the knowledge of information in that market? Do the sellers have a lot of information that the buyers don't have? And so if that's the case, then it's very imbalanced. The sellers are heavy on information and the buyers are very light on information. Or do all of the sellers and buyers, do they know everything that everyone else does? Is it the sort of thing where everybody, buyers and sellers, they know everything about the industry? And in that case, it would be very balanced. Now, we're going to draw our, uh, we're going to draw our, uh, oh, wait, let me give you one more example. There's also the possibility that one of the sellers knows th something that none of the other sellers know and none of the buyers know. Here's a great example. The recipe for Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola, I don't drink soda. Well, not anymore. Um, but uh, my dad, man, boy, did he love Coke. He, didn't, he hardly drank anything. Well, he drank, drank coffee. But as far as soda went, I never saw that man drink anything other than Coke. I think I may have seen him drink a 7-Up once. But really, my dad was a Coke person. He loved Coca-Cola. He got really upset when they, that, that period in the 80s when they came out with new Coke. And then they came back with Coca-Cola Classic. My dad loved that. Uh, that they came back with the Coca-Cola Classic because my dad loved the flavor of Coke. He also worked for several restaurants that served Coke. Uh, and so he, just, he was just a Coke person. I'm sure there are a lot of companies that have tried to duplicate the exact precise flavor and uh, carbonation of Coca-Cola, and they just haven't been able to match it. We've got a lot of knockoffs. I'm sure Pepsi was the first one. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, people love this. The Pepsi people, they love their Pepsi, and that's fine, too. But this example is an example about my dad, and he did not like Pepsi. Uh, to him, Pepsi just did not taste like Coke, and he could tell. If you poured a Pepsi into a glass and a Coke into a glass and he drank the Pepsi, he would say, this is not Coke. I don't want to drink it. If you poured any cola, any dark cola into a glass, if it was not Coke and my dad sipped it, he would know right away that is not Coca-Cola. The recipe for making Coca-Cola, the procedure for making Coca-Cola is very secretive. The Coca-Cola company does not want anybody to know how to duplicate Coca-Cola. And that's a situation where one of the sellers in the soda industry, Coca-Cola, they have information that no one else has. And so that is an example of uh, information um, I don't know, what's the opposite of symmetry? Dissymmetry or, um, I don't know, I'm sure an English, somebody who majors in English out there knows the answer to this question. But basically, there is very, very little symmetry or no symmetry at all in 
in the knowledge of this information because only one company and probably only a limited number of people within that company have the recipe for making Coca-Cola. All right. So actually, I'm going to be honest with you. I actually don't know anything about the soda industry. I just assume that that's the truth. I know they have the little vault at the, you know, where they, I'm sure the, the recipe probably isn't really in there. I don't know. Uh, it's probably just a museum. But anyway, the point I'm making is this, is every single industry has, is on a continuum where it's the degree to which the multiple players, and we're going to call the players in a market buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers oops, in a market have access to important information. Now, since Coke is a very popular product and a lot of people enjoy drinking it, the, the, the recipe for Coca-Cola is important information. And none of the buyers have access to that important information, and only one of the sellers has access to that important information. And so that, the information symmetry in the Coca-Cola market is secretive or in the soda market is very secretive okay and so here's what we're gonna do we're gonna say we're gonna make a continuum here and we're gonna say this is the continuum of information symmetry okay and so we're on a continuum so remember every single just like you know I'm I'm six foot one uh, and I might have a friend that's five foot eleven uh, and then I, you know, I could have another friend who's five foot two. Uh, if I have a hundred friends, all one hundred of us could be different heights. I could have another friend that's six foot one, but maybe I'm six six foot one and a half inches. I'm not, uh, but uh, and my friend is six foot one and three quarters of an inch. Okay, it's a it's a continuous spectrum uh, in terms of measuring height. Okay, it's a continuous variable. There are an infinite number of possible heights. In the very same way, each individual market, and there are thousands of markets out there in the industry. You have to think about economics that way. You have to think of it, and you have to think of business that way. That It's not just five markets out there, and it's not just 12 markets. There are thousands and thousands of markets out there, and most businesses will think of the product that they sell as being very narrowly defined as a part of a very narrow market. And that means there's thousands of them out there. And every single market out there is going to rank in a different place along the continuum of information symmetry. And here's where they're going to, here's where they're going to rank. They're going to go from one end when information symmetry is very, um, is very high. Let's put high over here. That would be perfect information symmetry okay so that's perfect symmetry perfect information symmetry means that everyone knows everything everyone knows everything and when I say everyone knows everything what I mean is this is that when one of the sellers 17 miles away from me, one of the sellers, so let's say I'm a seller of that product, and one of my competitors, 17 miles away, but we're in the same market. When that company lowers their price, I know right away, as they are lowering their price, when their price goes down by 50 cents per unit, I know within a second that their price just went down by 50 cents per unit. That is perfect information symmetry. Everyone knows everything. Also, all of the buyers in that very moment know that that price went down by 50 cents per unit. And because I know that their price went down by 50 cents per unit in that very moment, I can, if I want to, lower my price by 50 cents per unit as well in that very moment. 
And when I lower my price by 50 cents per unit, every single buyer is going to know right away that I also lowered my price. And that competitor that lowered their price, they're going to know right away that I lowered my price also. That is perfect information symmetry. Now, this is very, un this is very unrealistic. There probably is no market that has perfect information symmetry, but there are probably several markets that are very close to perfect information symmetry. Very close. Then we have all the way at the other end. Well, let's say somewhere in the middle here. Let's say about halfway in the middle. We have imperfect. Imperfect information symmetry. And that just simply means that for the most part, uh, people know some of the things that are going on, some of the changes, but there are so many things that nobody knows that they're happening as they're happening. You know, someone may change their price, and I don't find out for like three weeks that they changed their price because they're not advertising it to a lot of people. Maybe they're only advertising it to like, um, you know, their buyers, and their buyers only communicate with them. Their buyers don't come to me and tell me anything. All right? So that would be imperfect information symmetry. And then I'm going to go all the way over here on the low end of in information symmetry, and I'm going to say secretive, secretive information symmetry. Now, this is a situation where it's very, very difficult to get any kind of information about a particular seller. The buyers, they're, they're uh, you know, paying. They know the price, sure. But they don't know anything about the costs of that particular company because that, co that company is very secretive about, uh, about their costs. Here's a pretty good example. I wouldn't exactly put it in secretive, but I'll bet it's on the left side of the information symmetry is the uh, industry for brand new automobiles. When you go buy an, a brand new car, um, you know, you go in and they, the little sticker, the piece of paper in the car window, it says, here's how much, the car costs $25,000. That's an MSRP, right? But uh, don't pay MSRP. You need to negotiate, right? And then underneath there, they'll say, well, the invoice is, uh, is $20,000, right? And what I have heard, I'm not, I don't buy new cars frequently. My last car I bought was like 15 years ago, um, that the invoice price actually isn't really the invoice price. That's not how much the dealership paid for that car. That's just the printed invoice price. It's basically a lie because they're very secretive. Now, you can't go find out if that's really their invoice price. You're not allowed to go in there to their accounting department, find out how much they paid for it. What I've heard is that the actual invoice price is about 3% less than what the sticker says is the invoice price. But I'm going to go a step further. I've heard more information that says that that number isn't really their invoice price. That really only like the owner of the dealership knows actually how much he paid or she paid for that particular vehicle. And that that is a trade secret between the owner of the dealership and the automobile manufacturer. And that you can't know it. Uh, unless you are the dealer or if you are the, you know, one of the management sellers from the, from the uh, automobile manufacturer. And so in the automobile industry, what we have is, in many cases, very secretive information. And that's good for the automobile industry because now, because you as the buyer don't actually know how much they paid, you don't know how much profit they're earning. You don't know how much flexibility that they have in their negotiation. And so that's, that's good for that seller and not so good for the buyer, okay? All right, so that's our uh, fifth dimension, information symmetry. And these are the five dimensions of market structure. The last thing I want to say is this, and we're gonna, I'm going to continue. We're going to do one more thing, uh, one or two more things right after the, uh, this. But I want you to understand is that these five dimensions, these are, the five, these are five of the major dimensions of every market. There are other dimensions of market structures. And if you want to dig into what those other characteristics of markets are, you go right ahead and do that. But these are the five main ones that most people talk about when they are assessing a market. And these are the ones that I want you to know. Okay. All right. What I'd like to do now in this last segment is I want to show you what, uh, what I call the four basic market structures. Okay. So the four basic market 
structures. I'm going to put them across the top here. I'm going to put one here, one here, one here, and one here. And then what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you where each one of these four basic market structures ranks in terms of the five dimensions of market structure that I just, ex uh, just finished explaining to you in this lesson. Okay, So let's go through what are the four basic market structures. The first one is called perfect competition. Perfect competition. The second one you've probably heard of is called monopoly. A monopoly is, a, is one of the basic market structures. The third one is called monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition. And the fourth dimension is called oligopoly. Oligopoly. Okay? All right. So let's go through each one of these and hopefully you, you're going to go ahead and create this chart in your notes and we're going to identify how each one of these market structures ranks in terms of these five dimensions of market structure. Perfect competition, number of buyers and sellers. In perfect competition, there are many buyers and many sellers. When I say many, I mean lots and lots of them, thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions. There could be millions of buyers and tens or, or hundreds of thousands of sellers. Okay, perfect competition. Now understand, perfect competition is almost sort of a theoretical market structure. Uh, most situations where a, a, a market is perfect competition it's not actually perfect competition, it's just very close to perfect competition. It's so close to perfect competition. It's so close to perfect competition that it can't possibly be mistaken for monopoly, mo monopolistic competition or oligopoly. Okay, so like I said, this is sort of theoretical, but it's, uh, but it, uh, it, in most cases, businesses are close to perfect competition. They're not, they're not perfectly perfect competition. Okay? Market power. Uh, in perfect competition, there is no market power at all. No market power. Okay? Meaning sellers have no market power at all. So sellers are price takers. Price takers. Sellers in perfectly competitive markets, they accept the price that is generally agreed upon by buyers and sellers. And, and, and it just happens like what you've seen in a market uh, graph where, you know, wherever the supply and the demand curve uh, intersect that, uh, for the entire market, that determines the market price, the equilibrium price. And, and as long as uh, the government doesn't interfere in that market, that's the price, and anybody who wants to sell in that market has to take that price and sell for that price. And if they're not able to sell for that price, then they just can't do business in that market. Okay, so in per perfect competition, sellers are price takers. I draw a little line right here. No market power. Sellers are price takers. Barriers to entry and exit? There are none. There's not a single barrier to entry or exit. And this is one of the reasons why we can say that this is theoretical. There's always at least something small you have to do to get into a market, even if it's negligible, like making several phone calls or buying a cup of coffee or something like that. Uh, so, uh, but in perfect competition, there's not one single, no barriers to entry at all. Product differentiation. In perfect competition, there is no product differentiation at all. The product is completely, completely homogeneous. Again, this is theoretical, but in, in, in industries that are close to perfect competition, generally speaking, maybe they're not completely homogeneous, but they're in general homogeneous. So in perfect competition, we say that the product is homogeneous, uh, that, that there are no differences or very few or negligible differences from one product to the next. And then as far as information symmetry goes in perfect competition, there is perfect 
information symmetry. Everybody knows everything. When there's a price change, everybody knows it, buyers and sellers. There's no sneaky, the sellers know, but the buyers don't know. Well, the buyers have to know because they're the ones buying it. But it's not like uh, uh, the buyers don't know that there was a price change over there when they're about to buy here. So they're about to buy an exact same product over here for $5. But 20 minutes ago, that seller over there had their price go down by about a quarter to 475 Instantly, the buyers know they're going to go over there and buy the 475. Instantly, this person knows and they're going to lower their price to 475. Why? Because they're price takers. Okay? So there's perfect information symmetry, meaning there is, oh, asymmetry. That was my word from before. There is no information asymmetry at all. All right? So that is perfect competition. Now let's talk about monopoly. In monopoly, there are many buyers. Now, when I say monopoly, I want, here's what I want you to think. I want you to think the electric company. And when I say the electric company, I don't mean the company you send your check to. I mean the company that is actually producing the electricity in the gigantic factory that they have that produces electricity. Now, there is only one of those giant factories in the whole area. And they're the ones producing the electricity. That is a monopoly. There are many buyers of the electricity, but in a monopoly, mono meaning one, there is only one seller. There's no competition at all in monopoly because there's one seller. Not two sellers, not close to one seller. There is exactly one seller, which is why it's called mono monopoly. Okay? So many buyers, one seller. Market power, they have complete market power for the most part. The seller, not sellers, the seller is a price setter, is a price setter. That means in monopoly, they have a lot of market power. This company, this one seller, this one company has power to set the price that the buyers are going to pay. Barriers to entry and exit are extremely high, extremely high high barriers to entry and exit, which is one of the reasons why it is a monopoly. Now, in the ideal case of a monopoly, those extremely high barriers to entry are natural barriers to entry, not artificial barriers to, to entry. There may be a few negligible artificial barriers to entry here, but in most cases, if it's a legitimate monopoly, then these extremely high barriers to entry are natural barriers to entry. In most cases, it's just extremely high fixed costs. If I wanted to open up a power plant and sell electricity to people, not only would I have to build a power plant, which is extremely expensive, I would also have to install electrical wires that go from my power plant out to every single house. Could you imagine how much money it would cost for me to hook up my power plant to every single house? So then when people move into a house, they say, well, am I going to buy power from FPL or am I going to buy power from Mike? And if they're going to buy power from FPL, then they, you know, then they connect the wire that, that comes from FPL. But if they're going to buy power from Mike, then they connect the power that comes from uh, Mike's power. Uh, that's just extremely expensive. It would be insane. I wouldn't even be able to recover my costs in my revenues. And because the extremely high barriers to entry on a power plant are because of natural reasons, financial fixed costs, monopoly makes sense. Okay? And we'll talk more about that on the day that on the lesson where we focus on monopoly. Product differentiation, I'm gonna put a little star here, irrelevant irrelevant. And the reason that it's irrelevant is there's only one seller. So you can't have the, a product that's different from another seller if there's only one seller. So product differentiation is irrelevant. Same thing with monopoly for the most part. This is kind of irrelevant. Now you may say to yourself, well, it's relevant because maybe the monopoly has information and the buyers don't have that information. Or maybe the monopoly, that one seller has information and the buyers uh, uh, do have access to that information. Well, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter because usually having information just means that you'll go, you'll, you're gonna benefit by going to the right seller who's gonna be the best for you. 
There's only one seller. It doesn't matter what information that you have. You're buying. If you want to buy it, you're buying it from that one seller. Case closed. Game over. Okay. So information symmetry is irrelevant for a monopoly. Now let's talk monopolistic competition. In a in a market that is monopolistic competition, uh, there are many buyers and many sellers, just like perfect competition. Many buyers and many sellers. Market power in monopolistic competition, sellers are price setters. And so they have a little bit of market power. Okay? There's a good, I'm going to mention why in just a little bit, why they're price setters. Now notice, monopolistic is kind of like monopoly and competition is kind of like perfect competition. So you can see, like perfect competition, they have many buyers and sellers, but like monopoly, they are price setters. Okay? Uh, the sellers, that is. So the sellers are price setters. Okay? Uh, barriers to entry, typically low. Is not anybody can get into that industry or into that market, but any, any serious business that has some capital can definitely get into this market. Uh, product differentiation, uh, um, heterogeneous. This is why sellers are price setters, because they usually work very hard to sell a product that is very different than other products. Uh, they don't always succeed, uh, and again, it's, a lot of times it's in the mind of the consumer, the buyer, but these companies will spend a lot of money to, to design a product that is different and then to market that product so that it appears different, okay? Uh, and so uh, typically the, the product from one company to the next is going to be different from here to here to here to here, okay? Um, uh, think monopolistic competition, think cereal, you know? Uh, granted, uh, Post and Kellogg's, uh, or Kellogg and, um, and General Mills, uh, they have several products that are very similar to each other, but generally speaking, they are kind of unique cereals, and people pick their cereals that's, that are their favorites, and, and most of them are very different. Information symmetry. In monopolistic competition, we have imperfect information imperfect information symmetry. Now, I'm sure in some cases, in some products, it's very secretive, and in other products, it's just mildly imperfect. But generally, because the products are heterogeneous, it's hard for one company to get all the information that they need to be able to perfectly duplicate the product of one of their competitors, okay? And so the fact that the products are heterogeneous, a lot of times the reason for that is because the information in the market is imperfect, okay? So we've got imperfect information. Uh, and so now let's go on to oligopoly. In an oli now, oligopolies are very interesting markets. What's, what's really interesting about oligopoly markets is there are many buyers, but there are few sellers and most of those sellers or in in most cases the ones that you know they they are they are very you know kind of large sellers they have a they have a large amount of market power you know you have a you have a lot of market power in the hands of just a few companies maybe only seven companies uh, or maybe only three companies or something like that uh, so oligopoly think phone service right you've got AT&T Verizon Sprint T-Mobile and uh, that, uh, and a couple, probably a couple other ones. Excuse me, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on cell phone service, uh, but those are the biggest ones, right? So, cell phone service in the United States is kind of an oligopoly thing. Automobile industry, right? Not very many automobile manufacturers, but they're very large, and they all know each other. Airlines. There are probably a lot of airlines. There might be a few dozen airlines, but so probably more than that. But really, there's only a few really large players. And so that is oligopoly. Oligopolies are really interesting. You know, we know that there's a game called Monopoly. And one of my students once said, they should make a game called Oligopoly. I agree with that. Because even though they have a game called Monopoly, Monopoly isn't much of a game. Because there's only one player. A game of one player is not a game at all, but a game of a few players that are very competitive and want to control the game, that's cutthroat right there. That can be vicious. 
That would be a, a very, very fun game is an oligopoly game. In fact, when you sit down to play a card game or a board game, you're usually not playing with more than five or six people, and you're all watching each other trying to see what, you're, what, what the other person is doing with the goal of you want to win. And these guys, these few sellers, they do want to win. Market power, they are sellers. These few sellers, man, they are smart and they are good. Sellers are price setters. They work together to make when they can. Now, technically, uh, it, it's illegal for them to officially work together as one company, but a lot of times these few sellers, if they can try and work together without the government knowing it, they can act like a monopoly, like they're one business, and then each one of them gets their little piece of the profit. All right, it's very interesting. Uh, so sellers in oligopoly are price setters. They hold on to that, that market power as best as they can, all right, in, in most of them, all right? Barriers to entry, not extremely high, but, but, there, but definitely high uh, barriers to, I'll just put the word high, high barriers to entry. It's very difficult to become an oligopoly competitor. Uh, in many cases, if a business wants to move into a market that's an oligopoly market, instead of starting off from scratch, they'll just buy one of the existing businesses. So if there's some company that, wa that wants to get into airline travel, their best bet for getting into airline travel is just buy one of the existing airlines instead of trying to start up on their own. Okay? Uh, so there are high barriers to entry in the oligopoly market. Uh, product differentiation doesn't really matter. Here's what we're going to put in here. We're going to say that sometimes the, in some of the, the markets for oligopoly, the product is homogeneous. Think petroleum products, gasoline, ethanol-free gasoline, diesel, kerosene, that kind of stuff. For the most part, that is a homogeneous product. Now, Chevron would like you to believe that their product is heterogeneous because they put Tecron in their gas. And I'm going to agree, you know, yes, it is a little bit different, I guess, because they put something else in there. But generally speaking, gasoline is gasoline. Generally speaking, homogeneous. But, or I'm going to put, or heterogeneous. Some products, for example, the automo automobile industry, I'm going to argue, is heterogeneous that the cars are very different than one another. They're different on the inside, they're different on the outside. Sure, they all have steering wheels, generally four wheels, seats, and airbags. There was a time when it was a specialty thing to have airbags. But there are a lot of differences from one car to the next. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna argue that, that the automobile industry uh, is very heterogeneous among the sellers, all right? Uh, so you can, in an oligopoly, you can have homogeneous product or heterogeneous product. Information symmetry, man, I used to put imperfect here, but I'm going to put secretive. These guys, man, they are secretive. It's like working for an oligopoly company. Now, I've, I don't think I've ever worked for an oligopoly company, but the way that the research that I have read and my understanding of what I know about these businesses is they keep their secrets as best as they can. Okay, They do not want, if they have a secret that's allowing them to be profitable, in a way that their competitor is not profitable, they're going to try and keep that, uh, they, they call it, well, one way of calling it, it's called a competitive advantage. They're going to try and keep that competitive advantage a secret because, because if it gets out, then their primary competitor can copy that competitive advantage and start making profit that this company used to earn. So they do the best that they can to stay secretive. Sometimes they try to steal employees from one another. Where let's say that you work for uh, Delta for a long time and you want to go work for American. If you're a very valuable person from Delta who has a lot of information about how they do business, American Airlines, man, they'll pay a premium to hire you up and go work for them. So consider that. I'm sure the, some of the larger pharmaceutical companies are the very same way and maybe some of the uh, medical devices companies. So these oligopolies are very secretive about the information they have that they use to earn profit. Okay. So these are the four basic market structures. Like I said, there are probably an infinite different number of different combinations of these dimensions of market structure. But in the research in economics and in the conversations we're going to have, we're going to focus mainly on these four basic market structures.